Nós hoje estamos aqui com o Paul Haley em Oxford, na sua casa, e gostaríamos então de ter uma longa conversa com o Paul sobre o seu trabalho pessoal e o trabalho na Granada Center e em Manchester, a formação que tem feito ao longo desses anos de vários é, antropólogos visuais e vou convidar então uma das suas ex-alunas para fazer essa entrevista. Eu chamo a Silvia Caiubi para vir aqui entrevistar o seu professor e agora a colega. Ok, Paul. It's a good opportunity and an honor for me to be here. It's a great pleasure for me that you're here. Yeah. Both of you, I'm happy to welcome you. Yeah, and also because as a former student, I'm now interviewing my professor. Hardly. We're yeah. colleagues <laughs> and friends. So, I think we, we should talk about two different subjects. One is your work at Granada Center, and the other one, your career mm -hmm. as an anthropologist and a filmmaker. So, uh, how was your career between, from ethnology, to visual anthropology, or how do you feel acting in these two fields? Well, I, um, uh, like many people who found themselves doing ethnographic filmmaking, I didn't sort of conceive the idea when I was five and have subsequently been realizing it was by a series of accidents, really. Uh, as you know, I was a uh, very sort of conventional, classic, I would say classical uh, Amazonist. Uh, I did a PhD um, based on the best part of two years wearing a loincloth and living in a log house in, in, in uh, Venezuela and Amazonas. And I wrote a general ethnography on the basis of that and took a particular interest in uh, kinship systems because the, the people in question, the Panare, were highly endogamous um, to the extent not only did they um, have a very high statistical incidence of cross-cutting marriage, but they even married their granddaughters because they, that was seen as a different form of exchange. So you give somebody your daughter and he in due course gives you another daughter. So, you know, my <coughs> My interests were very, very classical. I had nothing to do with the visual at all. I had, it's true, since I was a teenager, I guess, been interested in photography, but not as a, you know, as a private interest. And I hadn't, I hadn't sought to, to c combine that with my professional formation at the point at all. Um, but then, whilst I was um, writing out my PhD, I happened to get to know, over, over the the older brother of a good friend of mine. Where did you get your PhD? In Cambridge. And the older brother of a friend of mine was a BBC producer and he was interested in making films with anthropologists. It was a kind of continuation with the BBC in Bristol of the Disappearing World series yeah. in Manchester. His name um, is Chris Curling. And um, he was interested in he, he, got a, he got a commission to um, run a whole new series, an anthropology series, based out of BBC Bristol. And indeed, he invited me and many others to apply to be a researcher on this program after we finished our PhD. And at that time, I thought, no, no, I don't want to do this, um, because I was very, still very committed to the idea of kind of Amazonist anthropology. And instead of <coughs> doing that, I um, continued and went on to a postdoc in uh, um, Amazonist uh, anthropology, let's call it that. And um, whilst I was doing that, he came uh, with a team from the BBC and made a film for, for television about the Panari and in particular their, their relationships with the non-indigenous people of the, of the region. And it was only that experience, in fact, even the, up until that point, I had a very naive idea about what a film consisted of. I, 
I think like many people, I had never really thought about the relationship between the, the, the material that was filmed and how it was edited. I wasn't aware of the fact. I, I assumed that you filmed, I don't know, you filmed for a given period and you took out the bad shots and what was left was the film. <laughs> I had, the whole notion of editing had not even occurred to me. And it was sitting in the edit suite, and, and uh, the great merit of Chris was that he, in contrast to many um, television producers who wanted to keep their anthropologists at arms late, once they'd shot the material, he very much encouraged us to come and sit in the edit suite with him. And I just saw this thing arise, like the phoenix from the ashes of, uh, of our experience. Um, and that was what really intrigued me, that uh, the, the way in which it was an artifact, but it was at the same time supposed to be reality, and it was that, that really um, interested me. And it was just by sheer chance after that, that um, the Royal Anthropological Institute um, set up this scheme to train a number of quote-unquote established anthropologists as filmmakers at the National Film and Television School. And I'm talking about 1984 now. And uh, I was very, very fortunate to be one of the first two people who were chosen to do that. Um, so I got a professional training as a um, 16 millimeter cameraman and director um, from one of the premier schools in Europe. Whilst I lived the life of a student whilst being paid a lecturer's salary. You well, know, you couldn't, you couldn't ask for better. But actually what was really good about it was that we were given money to go and make a film, a kind of uh, each year a film. We made a number of exercise films, but we made uh, a sort of full-length documentary in the fieldwork area where we had expertise and we were we were put together with a film partner which was a, who was a film school student. And this was the scheme of Colin Young. And it was Colin Young who was really the thinker behind this. He'd already tried this scheme in a different sort of slightly different way in California before. In 1970, he had been appointed to be the director of the um, film school here in, in Britain. And this scheme started around 1984, so it was a kind of idea that had been a long time in, 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 in the making. <clears throat> and so, um, the first year, I, I um, my experience with the Panari, who were the original indigenous group that I'd worked with, had not been very satisfactory, really. Because although we discussed it before with them, and would it be all right to bring the film crew, they, they were not really, they said yes in exchange for a certain number of machetes, um, but they were not really very happy with the ex experience. Mm. Um, so I went somewhere else and uh, made, a, made a film amongst um, some um, gold mining indigenous people who were Guyanese who um, had migrated back to their traditional homeland in Venezuela just over the border where there was a gold rush going on and that was the first, my first um, full length documentary. And now how do you, would you define yourself? You're an ethnologist and a visual anthropologist and a maker of filmmakers. For many years I was very kind of frustrated and in a way I'd almost say disappointed by the fact that running the Granada Center proved to be so sort of time consuming that my own filmmaking activities disappeared or became much less. I had fondly imagined that I would during the academic year, you know, from September to June, more or less, I would um, do my job as a, as a, as a, as a teacher of the program, and every summer I'd make a film. That was my idea. But it didn't happen, it hasn't happened. And not because I spend the whole summer kind of on the, <coughs> on the beach with my children. But um, I, I often ask myself, well, why has and you will understand this, I'm sure, that there's a way in which when you're a teacher, you put a bit of your soul in, into every film, that you're, every work, your students work. And the, we're sort of in a zero-sum situation here. You only have a certain amount of soul. You only have a certain amount of... <laughs> and so when the summers came round, I was exhausted. I didn't have any. And I, my, I, I, when it came to make my own film, 
I would, I need time, I need uh, some sort of, not, not time absolutely, but uh, time to, of a, of a particular kind where I could conceive of my own project. And um, so I suppose since I signed with Granada Centre, I've made a number of films that, um, where I worked as a freelance cameraman for UK television. And the great thing about that is I don't have to think beforehand. <laughs> Somebody rings me up and says, would you like to go to a prison for heroin addicts for a week? <laughs> and I say yes. because And it was in fact a great, very, very interesting experience. Or would you like to go and sleep out on the streets of London and film people's reactions to Diana's funeral? I say yes. I don't, I don't have to think about it beforehand and I hardly have to think about it afterwards. And just recently I made a couple of films about the history of the Thames, both of which were extremely interesting and I enjoyed it immensely. But I wouldn't regard, and I do that, the reason why I do that is because, as I mentioned before, over half the students go work in television. I think it's important for me to have some up-to-date knowledge mm -hmm. of that environment. And it's also an opportunity for me to make sure that my own sort of filming skills are, are, are kept to a professional. So I, um, I think that that's, that's my own contribution to the great circle of life, rather than as a filmmaker as such. But uh, your question was, do I think of myself as a filmmaker or an, or an ethnographer or an ethnologist? And uh, the truth is that I, I've attempted to um, keep abreast of um, Amazon ethnology. By uh, every other year, I give a lecture course on Amazon ethnology. But I can't. I've recently come to terms with the fact that I can't envisage going back to the field and doing original field work. Good work. And unless you keep on doing that. I think you have to recognise that you're no longer an ethnologist of that particular kind of the fieldwork kind. I guess the last time I, I did a did any kind of fieldwork of a lowland uh, of an Amerindian kind, should we say, as I as the film that I made with um, Dieter Heinemann about the Warao, about this Warao shaman, Antonio Ronson. But I can't envisage going back to Benari for months on end and. Um, I'm doing some particular fieldwork project. Mm. Let me ask you a traditional question. Mm. What are the anthropologists that influence your work? As a as a uh, as an ethnologist and as a filmmaker. I think that all um, all ethnologists, <coughs> all Amazonists, <coughs> well, certainly in the in the European tradition. Uh, still, even now, deeply influenced by living source. In my case, not directly from the man himself, but as it was permeated through the works of um, Philippe Descola and Christine Taylor, um, more locally Peter Riviere, um, all of these people, in some sense, drew on the structuralist, structuralist tradition. Um, <coughs> or, and thinking in, ter in Brazilian terms, uh, like many of us uh, feel that I have been in some kind of dialogue with Eduardo Videvich, the Kestrel was another kind of prophet of the, of the Levitorsian <coughs> doctrine. I would say all those people influenced me. Um, but I, I have a sort of schizophrenic identity as an anthropologist because I was, then there's that on the one hand, and on the other hand there's, there's my interest in, in films. And here, of course, the figure of Colin Young is looms large in my life, as, as, as in many. Also the person who taught me in a much more sort of hands-on way at a film school, uh, not an anthropologist, a documentarist, uh, a larger-than-life Italian-American called um, Umberto Di Gioia, Umberto Di Gioia, Gioia who's, who's no, mostly known by his, his American name, which is Herb, Herb Di Gioia. And he was a, uh, he influenced many people who came out of the film school. He himself had been taught by Colin 
in California in the 60s, and he influenced many people coming out of this film school in the sort of late 70s and early 80s, including um, Miss Molly Deneen. Let's talk about your film now. Faces uh, in the Crowd. Faces in the Crowd, exactly. How did you, did you decide to film that subject? Well, the <coughs> important thing to say is that that film is the result of a collaboration between myself and uh, the anthropologist uh, on whose work it was uh, founded, who's called Anne Robottom. And um, it arose in the first place because um, Anne, at that time, was a PhD student. Um, she was a student of Marinette's Desserts, in fact. And um, she was doing research on the way in which the royal family acted as a kind of symbol of national identity, at a, how that played out at a grassroots level. And um, she was looking at the way in which the royal family were um, presented in the media as a sort of focus of national identity and so forth. And one of the most important aspects of her research was this field work which involved going around the country um, with these uh, self-styled royalists. And rather on the principle, same sort of principle, that um, the extreme case can illustrate the norm. Um, <clears throat> she thought that although these people manifested their um, beliefs in a rather extreme way, they nevertheless gave us an insight into to the way in which the royal family perceived at a, at a kind of grassroots level. Um, but in initially, the idea started off not as a big film idea, as such, but more almost like a documentation project. Because she explained to me that at these walk, royal walkabouts, there was like a kind of um, uh, ballet, but without a choreographer. Because um, due to a sort of concatenation of circumstances, um, this performance took place, but nobody actually conceived it and arranged it. This was because the royal watchers, as they're sometimes known, the royal fans, royalists, um, would go and park themselves there hours and hours and hours before the royal family. They'd sometimes sleep overnight and hope to meet them in the morning and so forth. And they would situate themselves in a place immediately opposite where the royal person was due to come out. And um, they would travel all over the country to do this, from one end of the country to the next. And um, so they became known to the, uh, the royal family's private detectives and security people whose job it is to sort of walk around beforehand and make sure that <coughs> there was nobody, an assassin or, or a protester or something. And the royal security people knew perfectly well that these people were genuine fans of the royal family they weren't going to give the queen a bomb or lump of shit flowers. Or, or they knew they were going to give them flowers but they weren't going to do anything aggressive or, or, or hostile and so when the queen or Diana or whoever it might be came out they would sort of guide them towards these royal admirers and the photographers whose job it was to um, to uh, photograph these things, knew that this was going to happen. So they would situate themselves, mm. so knowing they would definitely get their <coughs> photographs if they did. And so as a result of this ballet, um, if you looked in the newspaper and you see the Queen meeting um, the crowd in Edinburgh one week and then a month later meeting the crowd in, I don't know, London, you'll find she's often meeting the same people. <laughs> because it's the same group of people who are traveling around the country. I see. And although she may have met many, many other people on each occasion, because the photographers knew that they were definitely going to meet. Because that was the extraordinary thing about these royal watches, is that they would go to these world events, and they had a kind of 90% strike rate. They almost always met the royal person, which actually is quite extraordinary in a way, when you think there were thousands of people there. <laughs> And they met them because of these yeah, circumstances. Strategies, yes. yes. And so our initial intention for the film was simply to film this ballet without a choreographer, how these sort of things came about. And that, indeed, in the early part of the film, you'll remember that the Queen goes to Leeds, which is a sort of run-down 
over a rundown area of Leeds. And uh, with Prince Philip, and you see her receiving various gifts. I don't know if you remember that moment in the film. Well, that was the first thing we filmed. That, that, mm -hmm. uh, and then I thought, well, this is very interesting, that we need to have find out more about these people who, who are doing this. Uh, we, had to, we hung out too and had various interesting conversations. I don't know if you remember that sequence where we ask Colin Edwards, who was the sort of uh, most flamboyant of the royalists, um, about his plans and why he does it, and he explains that, well, you know, he's not into football. Um, but football fans go around all around the yes. country. Well, why shouldn't this was his hobby? Why shouldn't mm -hmm. he do it? Um, so um, we thought, well, this is interesting. We need to go and meet some of these people um, uh, in their private lives and um, um, find out what motivates. And so that's when we went to to do the interviews with them in their homes, with the various homes, and we went to various other royal walkabouts. The Diana sequence that opens the film, for example, um, we did later, uh, and equally the, the, I think the one with the Queen Mother, we did actually do last, so it, it does actually. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing with Diana was just a, such a little brief thing, we decided to sort of put it in, put it, bookend the film, have it at the beginning and the end, so that it kind of gave a sense of closure to the film. I see. What we don't have in the film is the reaction of the royal family to the royalists. <laughs> uh, well, um, I got a little bit of that um, not long after the uh, making of that film because um, Diana was made the royal patron of the Royal Anthropological Institute. Oh. And she, in a very diligent sort of way, um, went round various anthropology places and tried to find out what this strange multi-syllabic word anthropology actually meant. And uh, amongst other places, she came to the Granada Center and she uh, looked at various materials produced by my students. She brought her husband along, by the way, her, her, her then husband, uh, a sometime student of anthropology. Are you aware of the fact that Prince Charles? Charles yes. uh, did study anthropology in, uh, at Cambridge as an undergraduate briefly. And also his son. Oh, yes, son. yes, yes, yes. William. Um, did William study anthropology? In St. Andrews. You think so? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Did. Oh, right, 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 right. I didn't even know that. <laughs> uh, certainly his brother did, his young brother did, Prince Edward, he also studied anthropology at Cambridge. But anyway, so she, um, in fact, I met her, I met her on two, Diana on two occasions. Once when she came to Granada Centre, another time when I had to go with a group of other anthropologists to go and tell her where anthropology was. And on each of these occasions I showed her some material. And the first occasion I showed her some material of um, her, uh, of a film that one of my students had made, I don't know if you ever saw it, called Why Wear White, which was about why young women wear white. Mm, which nice. is a symbol of virginity and purity, etc., etc., when they no longer are uh, usually cohabiting before they're married. Mm -hmm. And I showed a little extract from this film where somebody is dressing up in a dress that clearly modeled on Diana's own wedding dress and so forth. And she said, Oh, this is when she's doing a kind of rehearsal for her wedding, you know, just a fitting of the wedding dress. And uh, she says, um, Oh, she said, um, the, the character in the film says, when you're dressed like this, I feel like you're a princess for the day. <laughs> and uh, Diana looked at this and said, she's lucky it's only one day. <laughs> but at that time, we didn't know, or the world as a whole didn't know, yeah. there were all these kind of problems. So in retrospect, the comment becomes much more significant. Um, but when she came to the Granada Centre itself, I was sufficiently, to say this in Portuguese, atrevido, mm -hmm. to um, show her some of the material of the Royal Watch and see what she would say about that. Because she definitely had a sense of humour. And uh, so uh, she's looking at the material of the Royal Watch and 
I could tell by her expression that she found the whole thing rather excruciating. But she had a certain sympathy for them, I have to say. Um, but there is one moment where um, one of the characters says, oh, well, you know, we paint these pictures. The character's talking about how he's painting, how he painted a picture of the queen, which he's going to give the queen. Mm. It's a naive work. And he says, uh, well, um, well, we, we like to make these, we like to do these paintings, and I'm sure they like to receive them. Uh, at which point uh, Diana said, that's what you think. <laughs> so they have no room for a <laughs> Yes, uh, exactly, exactly, exactly. But anyway, um, that, 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 that was the... Um, <coughs> they must, but they obviously thought there was... Uh, they wouldn't have done it. They had started doing it, didn't actually historically start doing it, until about 1967 and 1968, when the Queen apparently... I think it was in New Zealand. She did it for the first time. Went to the one previous to that. The royal family never did that sort of thing. They didn't sort of meet people in the street. It was the first time that she went on this walkabout. And they obviously decided uh, to do it as a strategy so that people would feel that they had. And it's um, true that <coughs> over the years they got to know the royal, royal watchers too. And um, the Queen never acknowledged that she knew people, but she obviously did recognize them because they, she met them several times a year, these, these royal people. Mm. And um, one, one particular example that I um, recall particularly vividly was um, when we made a subsequent film for the television, the UK television, um, the leading character in that column got quite a bit of um, satirical criticism in the newspapers and um, I, we had discussed beforehand the risks that this would entail and he said oh don't worry about that I'm used to that um, because I've been subject to a lot of criticism in the tabloid in the mm. popular press he said oh I can take it and don't worry I've had enough of that he just asked you a question. Was it too hard to film in the streets? Because all the film was shot outdoors, almost all of all the film. Was it hard to film? No, it wasn't at all difficult. I mean, even though when I shot that in 1991, 92, I can't remember what year exactly, um, I was shooting with a much bigger camera, um, uh, an SBHS camera it was, much bigger than that, that thing. Um, no, because uh, I suppose it was kind of like a performance for the media anyway, that whole thing. Mm. So that there were lots of people around, photographers around. So I think that probably what was distinctive about it and why it has a kind of distinctive feel possibly to it was that whereas all the officially accredited press were on the other side of the barriers mm -hmm. and they were there to film the, the Queen meeting the people I was there to film the people meeting the Queen, and so therefore I chose, despite the relative difficulty, <coughs> to, to shoot from behind their heads. I suppose in that sense mm -hmm. it was a bit of difficulty, but I felt that that was <coughs> important to give the atmosphere of, you know, looking through the sea mm -hmm. of heads to see the Queen. Whereas if you had been around the other side, it would have been much less engaging. I yes, I know. Why, why is it called Faces in the Crowd? Well, <coughs> it's quite simple. One of the characters is asked by the anthropologist who, who worked with me on this film, and Robot, what do you think the royal family think of you? And she says, oh, I don't think they feel anything. I think we're just faces in the crowd. And uh, so in a sense, we thought that would be a good title to show that behind these faces in the crowd is actually an English phrase, a metaphor for, for uh, anonymity. Um, but in fact, that they each have their stories. That was the idea. Então, esse é o filme que nós vamos ver agora, Faces in the Crowd, que talvez em português a gente pudesse traduzir por rostos na multidão, o filme feito pelo Paul Henry. Aproveite.